Hello, I'm Dr Gabrielle Heffernan. I'm the Assistant Curator of Designated Collections at Hull Museums and I'm also an Egyptologist. I'm here at Hands On History where I'm going to be talking about the Egyptian collections as part of our Spotlight On season. Today I'm going to be talking about the replicas from the tomb of Tutankhamun. Now, to understand these objects really, we have to go back to the early 1920s um, when Howard Carter, the Egyptologist, was excavating in Egypt and he discovered the doorway to a tomb. And when it was opened, it was found that it was the tomb of Tutankhamun, a previously little-known pharaoh. Um, and the tomb was full of beautiful objects. Howard Carter referred to them as wonderful things. And over the next few years, streams and streams of gold and jeweled objects were brought out of this tomb and were taken to Cairo and were then exhibited. And with this began a worldwide fascination, not only with Egyptology, but with Tutankhamun, the boy king, and Tutmania was born. Now, if we then come back to England at the same time, there were plans underfoot to create a British Empire exhibition at Wembley. This exhibition was intended to showcase the Empire of Britain, to increase trade links, to show the strength and the power of the Empire. And the different colonies of the Empire were invited to come and showcase their culture, their industry and so forth. Now, at the time, Egypt wasn't actually part of the Empire, but it was felt that because the dig was run by an Englishman, Howard Carter, and because it was funded by another Englishman, Lord Carnarvon, that actually this could be included in the empire as part of the British success. So the decision was taken to not put Egypt into the actual exhibition, but to create a replica tomb of Tutankhamun in the amusement park next door. Now, this was quite a large undertaking, so the Organisers of the exhibition hired um, a well-known sculptor called William Aumonier and his, his team to create the sculptures and they were asked to copy the furniture that had been excavated from the tomb of Tutankhamun, these wonderful things, to be put in the exhibition. They were also asked to work with an Egyptologist called Arthur Weigel. Now, Weigel was both an Egyptologist, as I said, so he had a very good knowledge of Egyptian culture, but he was also a journalist and he had covered, in his journalistic capacity, the opening of the tomb of Tutankhamun. So he'd seen many of these objects himself, which made him perfectly placed to advise the sculptor William Aumonier on creating these replicas. And one of the big challenges was that there were no um, good photos of the object at the time, or any of the objects, because they hadn't yet been fully documented and catalogued. All that the team had to go on were the press photos that had been used in newspapers and donated to the press to be used. So the fact that the replicas we have are of such incredible quality is even more impressive when you think that, that they weren't even copied from the original objects. They were covered from press photos taken in haste at the excavation site. And this statue that we have in our museum, I think very much shows the high quality, not only of the replicas, but of the original objects. And this statue is what we call a car statue. So it represents the spirit or the car of the deceased. And it's one of a pair that would have stood at the entrance to the burial chamber of Tutankhamun. And if you look at it, you can immediately see it's coloured black, but his clothes are gold. And in the original objects, obviously this was real gold. He wears a kilt and he carries in his hand a mace. And that's the kind of globe on a stick, if you like. And these objects were often held by kings and they were held up high above the head. And often the king would stand like this and to the ground, he would have a prisoner or an enemy kneeling in front of him. And he would be in this position about to smite his enemies. And this showed the strength and the power of the king as the ruler of Egypt. On his head, he wears a Nemes headdress and he wears a uraeus on his forehead or a cobra. And this cobra represented the goddess Wajet, and she would spit at his enemies to protect him. So not only was he strong and powerful, he was also divinely protected. He was chosen of the gods, and they made sure that he remained king. Now, this image of a strong, powerful king is actually very different from the quite young and inexperienced ruler that we now know Tutankhamun to have been. 
So if we look at this throne, we can see the exceptional quality of the replicas. As I said, these were copied from photographs, but the colours are almost exactly as those in the original. Care has been taken to make sure they match the original object. And the details are so careful. So the crown that the king is wearing, and this is Tutankhamun with his wife, Anksen Amun, he wears a crown on his head and you can see these tiny red sun disks and the cobra coming out of the sides of the crown. These details have been done so carefully to make sure that they really convey the beauty of the original object. And then if we go around to the side of the throne, we can see um, a uraeus, a winged uraeus, and his wings, each individual feather has been painted a colour. And that is to show that the original inlay was glass. So these have been painted to look exactly like the original inlaid wings of the cobra. But there's one other quite interesting detail on this throne. And if we go around to the back, you can see this. On the back of the throne, there's no decoration. Now, was this an error by the people that made it? Was it some kind of mistake? No, what this is, is that these objects, whilst being of incredibly high quality, were essentially a set. So the tomb was created, the replica tomb, for people to go in and almost imagine they were Howard Carter discovering the tomb. So the objects were laid out in a way that looked as they would have looked in the original tomb, which means that certain parts of the objects wouldn't have been visible. So we can only assume with this chair, because the original was decorated with text, with cartouches, with cobras, it was beautifully decorated on the back. We can only assume that this replica was placed in such a way that no one could see the back of it. And so to save time and probably some kind of expense, they didn't decorate it. Which I think really reminds us that these objects, they are, they're a stage set. That's what they were created for, for an incredible exhibition. They are beautiful, high quality set, but that's what they are. And their importance um, and their beauty was really recognised by a prominent Hull businessman, Albert Ricketts. And after the exhibition closed at Wembley in 1925, and it was a resounding success, he bought the replicas and he bought them back to Hull and then they were donated to Hull Museums and that's why they're displayed here. Uh, whilst being linked to a tomb in Egypt of several thousand years ago, they actually were brought to Hull by one of our most, most well-known citizens. If you want to come and discover the collections for yourselves, Hands-On History is open on the second and the fourth Saturday of every month.